All right, I got interested in following a lot of this because I grew up in the Northwest in uh, Scablands. And, uh, you know, and, and tying all these dates together is has got me in a, in a quagmire. I, I understand the Murray Springs and the 12,800, that's easy to date. But then on the floods, they have specific ways to date those, like the Bonneville flood supposedly happened 17,400 years ago. And all the Columbia River floods that came through the Northwest happened between 17,000 and 15,000 years ago. So, uh, you know, and I'd like to think it was an impact too, you know, and it very well could have been, it could have been a separate one, but there's different, there's, there's time differences, you know. Uh, there isn't any flood event that they found that happened 12,800 years ago. They, they, from the Burlington Wash area by Walla Walla, they have 40 different stratas that they've seen from backwaters flowing in. And, and in fact, the way they really dated it was from the Mount St. Helens volcano that exploded 16,000 what was it, 16,300 years ago, and it's between the 11th and the 12th layer down. So, in Burlingame Canyon. So, uh, and that was on, in Lake Lewis. And then they also I have- can, can, I, can I just say one thing Im sure. immediately to be clear? The, the Comet Research Group, <laughs> of whom Alan West is a member, do not claim that the channeled scablands were caused by flooding from the Younger Dryas impact. That is right. not part of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. I didn't say it was. So, I, so, I'm trying so, to say if there was a cataclysm. I they mean, they see the flooding as going flooding. north up through the Mackenzie River. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a, a the, the, the question of the Scablands is a, is, a, is a mystery in its own right. And the multiple flood theory, which I think Randall will, will address in a moment, is a theory that is well deserving of criticism, but it's important to be clear that the damage to the channel scablands is not claimed by the Comet Research Group as part of the evidence for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. And, uh, and that's good. It's probably because of the difference in dates. It does not depend upon the dating of the scablands. And it's, it's, a and uh, it's a separate body of evidence. However, the very first dating of the scablands flood, <clears throat> based on that Mount St. Helens set as Tefra, was done by Donald Molyneux, published in 1978. He dated it to 13,100 years, plus or minus 350 years. So early in my research, I was relying on his dates. Now, there's been additional dates based upon geomagnetism and beryllium-10 dates, which do put it all older. But it does, like Graham just said, it's a separate mystery. Now, is there a connection? I'm open to whatever, but yeah. there, it, it is a separate mystery. Now, I will say the work of James Teller further east in the area of the, of the Great Lakes does appear like the, the, the draining of, the catastrophic draining of Lake Agassiz that came down through uh, the Minnesota River Valley, came down through the St. Croix River Valley, drained north through via the Mackenzie River Valley into the Arctic, does appear to date very close to the Younger Dryas impact boundary. So I, these are open questions. And, and you know, you are raising those questions right. and I think it's definitely valid to raise those questions. And what we can say is that there does seem to be a whole concentration of extraordinary events that, that occurred within a very narrow window of time. Was there earlier? I mean, the, 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 the graph that both uh, Graham and, <coughs> and George showed of the, of the Younger Dryas, you know, there was that peak of Meltwater Pulse 1A at, at 14,600 years ago. What caused that? I don't know. But these are open questions. Boy, that covered it real well. Um, only thing I'd add, remember when I said that even clicks can have differences? Now, if we're a benign click, right, you take the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis advocates, they're gonna be <clears throat> the published science, use your absolute very, very best evidence and you don't speculate. Then they're gonna be other people that are science communicators like these gentlemen that are gonna provide some speculation. And I'd add that the Willamette meteorite, I've always seen that it rafted there 13,000 years ago, so something happened, right? And if there were multiple floods, and perhaps there were, I think it would be 
um, surprising if one of those floods wasn't caused by the trauma that we've described and that maybe you accept that was globally, but yeah, floods are squirrely, right? And so is radiometric dating. Well, it appears to be that there was like 40 different floods because That's of the slack water deal. And so it was something that was occurring over and over again. And then in Lake Columbia, there was 89 and, and uh, I wrote some notes down. I got most of my information from a guy named Z Nick Zentner. Yeah, and he's, does. the 89 floods, he's drawing from the work of Brian Atwater, who looked at, who did VARV counting in the San Poil River Valley. And I, you know, I think it's tremendous work. But I do think there are questions that we can uh, that we need to ask about the, the the forty plus floods, if we're assuming that each flood is the result of a separate damming of Lake Missoula, and each damming of Lake Missoula requires an independent damming of the Clark Fork River with an advance of the Purcell Trench ice lobe. And I think there are major problems with that, which is primarily due to the fact <clears throat> that ice is a permeable material. And um, we can look at modern examples of outburst floods, and we see that basically the difference here is three orders of magnitude. Modern floods, you look at modern outburst floods, they typically uh, reach maximum depths of one to 300 feet before the ice mm. completely fails. In the Missoula floods, we're talking about ice reaching uh, up to 2,100 feet, uh, or the water reaching up to 2,100 feet against the ice dam with basal pressures of in excess of 950 PSI. And we've never witnessed anything remotely like that in, re in modern outburst floods, which to me is enough to question that particular model for uh, Missoula flood or Scabland flood origins. And you also have the, the Bonneville flood. Ra Randall and I were having a, a conversation about this the other day. And those, those uh, proposed earlier floods raises a, another big question, is where did the energy come from? This is what uh, Randall calls the energy paradox. What was the energy that generated those floods between 18,000 and 15,500 years ago? Uh, it's, it's, it's absent from the picture. We don't see anything that could have caused that. The notion, the notion of 80 or 90 ice dams building and then breaking, I mean, it's an, ex, ex, it's, it's an extraordinary... Uh, picture that is that is being created here, and one that is just full of questions that have never been answered by the by the mainstream on this. So the multiple floods hypothesis is by no means the word of God. It is a it is a particular it is a particular theory, but there are problems with that theory which remain unexplained. The one thing about the Younger Dryas impact is it provides an energy source, an enormous mm. energy source uh, that that could account for these events. So we. We, I, I want, again, I right. want to make clear that the Comet Research Group is not claiming the channeled scablands as part of their evidence database. Absolutely I, not. I, I, I know, I, but I, I think it's, no important, it's, it's that. important that I, that, be, that be clear. But, the, but the, issue, the issue of the energy paradox is important. Right. And the issue of whether you can actually build 90 ice dams and break them down over that period of time is another, is another mystery that remains to be solved, but is a separate mystery.